I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Sam Bankman-Fried speaks, but questions remain. We discuss the mystery that still surrounds the missing billions at SBF's bankrupt crypto exchange, FTX. Then we're turning into a buy now, pay later economy, especially this holiday season as shoppers try to stretch their dollar. Klarna's CEO on its fight to reach profitability and how regulation could impact the buy now, pay later industry. And Musk takes a break from Twitter to talk, well, brain surgery. The world's richest person says Neuralink could start human implants within six months and makes big promises for the tech, including cures, for paralysis and blindness. Well, first, let's get a check on those markets. Here is Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld. Hi, Katie. Hi, Ed. Well, it was a pretty muted day overall. Remember, we had a big, big rally yesterday after Powell suggested that maybe the Fed might start dialing back the pace of rate hikes. Then you look today ahead of the big payrolls print tomorrow. Not too much movement in the S&P 500. The Nasdaq 100 squeaked out a little bit of a gain. You did see a big drop in the stocks. But again, at the big benchmark level, not too much movement, even though we're looking at a pretty big rally in the bond market, those 10-year Treasury yields dropping by about 10 basis points or so. But this muted volatility that we've been seeing in the markets, it's definitely a theme. Let's take a look at the volatility index, the VIX, if you will. It dropped below 20. It has a 19 handle. And as you can see, it's just been grinding tighter and tighter in this very narrow range. So even though, I don't know, it's felt like a pretty volatile year, not too much action at the stock market level. But at, I'm dying to talk about crypto. Let's do that right now and look at Bitcoin because Bitcoin, even amid all of this chaos that we're seeing at the company level in the wake of what we saw with FTX, Bitcoin is actually having a pretty good run. It's up about two and a half percent or so over the past five days. And I'm going to say it, it's a macro asset. It's doing fine. All right, let's stick with this broader theme, Katie. Stay with us. We look at the biggest story in crypto right now, the ongoing story, FTX's collapse. And Sam Bankman-Fried, who was at one point worth $26 billion, he now claims, quote, that's worth close to nothing. Those were his words at the New York Times Deal Book Summit yesterday. And luckily for us, Bloomberg's Annie Massa was in the room and joins us now for more. Did we solve the mystery, Annie, of the missing billions and where they are? I think uh, that would be a little bit too easy. We're far from fully having solved the mystery. Um, so yesterday, SPF did speak at the Deal Book Conference here in New York. And I would say he answered a lot of questions, but we didn't get a lot of answers. He's kind of on an apology tour now, giving his side of the story and saying that he's sorry that he screwed up um, and overextended, basically. But he, he, as far as actually offering any explanation of what went wrong, uh, he hasn't given us much. Annie, there was some surprise that he actually turned up, um, albeit virtually. You know, he joined from the Bahamas. But uh, you were there. There were some protests on site against him appearing at the conference, weren't there? Absolutely. So even to get into the venue, which was in Columbus Circle in Manhattan, there were protesters outside, kind of these dueling camps of protesters who were protesting not just SBF and had pamphlets saying that this guy's an embezzler, but they were also protesting others uh, on, the, on the program as well, which was a little bit of a surprise to see all their names alongside uh, Sam Bankman Freeds, but he was one of the people making an appearance there that they were absolutely protesting. It was a little bit controversial that he appeared at all. He was on this program to appear at the conference long before FTX's blow up. And so some people were surprised that he got the, the platform to speak. But to their credit, there were some really tough questions. And SBF tried to wriggle free, but didn't really 100 percent pull that off. Well, Annie, to your point, it's just amazing that this man keeps talking. And I want to talk about where we could see him speak next, because the Senate did hear, held a hearing today on the FTX collapse. Mm. Can we expect to see SBF actually on the floor of Congress at any point? I mean, it, it's definitely possible. One thing that came up at the conference was uh, SBF was asked, what do your lawyers make of the fact that you're appearing here today virtually? And he kind of grumbled that they <laughs> didn't really, they weren't too happy about it. So he's going a bit rogue, it would appear. Katie, we were glued to our computer screens, as we always are. SBF, not the only speaker. 
uh, not at least on this topic. Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, what's she been talking about? You know, so, oh, sorry. I mean, I'll, let me take this. I want to talk about Janet Yellen because it's interesting trying to map the contagion. Obviously, when we talk about contagion, there's been a lot of worries about spillover into the broader financial system. But Janet Yellen, she did say yesterday that if you look for the silver linings, basically, the good part of this explosion, that it hasn't really spilled over into the traditional banking sector. And that point was actually echoed by Michael Barr today, of course, the Fed vice chair for supervision. He said that the crypto risks to the core financial system, they've been muted so far. So if you're looking for systemic sort of fears here. They really haven't appeared yet. A lot of folks have been weighing in, Annie. We just heard about the kind of Yellen perspective. Larry Fink, for example. What are these voices saying about the FTX situation? Yeah, Larry Fink's an interesting one. He was also on the program at the Dealbook conference yesterday, and he mentioned that this is known, but BlackRock had some exposure to FTX. It had made a $24 million investment through a fund of funds. So... Fink was saying that he thinks that there's definitely a reckoning to come, and BlackRock is not immune from that, uh, nor are any number of VCs that invested in FTX. Okay, Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld and Annie Massa unraveling the unravelable. Thank you. Meanwhile, Apple is ramping up work on its long-awaited mixed reality headset. The company changed the name of the operating system to XROS, according to sources. That's a nod to extended reality, which encompasses both augmented and virtual reality. The headset would be its first major new product category since the Apple Watch in 2015. Who had the scoop, of course, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who joins us now from Los Angeles. Mark, XROS, what's the thinking behind it? Yeah, Ed, thank you so much for having me. So originally when they've been working on this mixed reality operating system, which like you said, blends AR and VR, they were calling it Reality OS and ROS, but they've shifted now to a term called XROS. It's a bit shorter and it's more translatable across many geographies, right? Reality is not a word like iPad or iPhone or watch or TV that's very universal. Reality is not a universal word, so they needed more of a universal term. That's why they're leaning towards XROS. They've also trademarked XROS in several countries internationally, and they're fighting for the trademark in the U.S. as well with an unrelated Chinese company who actually coincidentally filed for the XROS name back in March. In real terms, this is a market that Meta dominates, right, for the AR, VR headset. What's the timeline for Apple to bring this product to market? It's still a pretty small market, but technically, yes, Meta is the dominant player there with their Quest headsets, uh, Sony with their PSVR, their PlayStation VR. There's a new one coming uh, soon as well. They're a big player there, HTC, uh, Lenovo. Uh, Samsung has played it in a little bit with partnerships with back in the day what was called Facebook. Uh, in terms of Apple, 2023 is the year of the Apple headset. It's going to be called probably the Reality One or the Reality Pro headset run XROS, it's going to have mixed reality versions of messages, of maps, of FaceTime, games, video watching, TV+, plus, you name it, uh, live sports streaming in virtual reality in a 3D-like environment. This is going to be the hot product of 2023. This is really going to be Apple's next big thing. It'll be introduced sometime uh, around the middle of the year, most likely. Uh, it's going to be quite expensive. Apple's been looking at price points between two and $3,000. Certainly going to be the most advanced mixed reality headset on the market to date. Really going, you know, full throttle on both of those technologies. It'll have the best cameras on the market for AR, but it'll also have the best displays on the market for VR. And the real magic of this headset is how Apple is going to be able to blend the two in a way that you haven't seen Meta or others do so far. All right, 2023, year of the Apple virtual reality headset. You heard it here first. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, thank you. Coming up, holiday shopping trends and Klarna's path to profitability. We'll discuss all that and more with Klarna's CEO next. This is Bloomberg. Friday has been boom time for buy now 
pay later products. It's a financial product that lets you pay in installments and its use has skyrocketed during the holiday shopping extravaganza. Adobe says that its use climbed 68% compared to pre-holiday. And one provider, Afterpay, said its use actually rose 120% compared to the pre-holiday season. But does this all mean we're actually setting ourselves up for a debt headache in the future? They do promise interest-free payments, but they're only free if you follow the rules. So check the small print, because if you're on a longer term monthly buy now, pay later plan, you could be up to 30% in terms of interest costs. Maybe if you do a late fee or have to reschedule a payment, that could cost you from $1 to $10 a go. Roughly 11% of all borrowers using Buy Now, Pay Later fell behind schedule in their payments in 2021. And if you're 18 to 29 years old, that number grows to almost 20%. That was, of course, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde there on Buy Now, Pay Later trends in the holiday shopping season. We also took to Twitter to ask our audience about this. And while BNPL is gaining ground, it does seem, based on our poll, that the credit card is still king when it comes to the preferred means of spending. I want to bring in Klarna CEO, Sebastian Shimiatkovsky, for more on this. We're going to talk about your earnings, but first, buy now, pay later. I bet you've got a pretty interesting take on the Klarna view for buy now, pay later. Well, sure. I mean, first of all, is we actually think of ourselves as a payment network, uh, a third party payment network, uh, you know, like a Visa, MasterCard kind of thing. And so 40 percent of our volume is debit. Uh, we're obviously associated with credit, but just worth highlighting that fact. Yeah. With that said, I do think buy now, pay later is a, a better formulated credit product than a credit card. Right. So it doesn't push you into revolving. It doesn't it's not borrowing against all of your spending. It's only for single transactions and it has a fixed installment period and it's no interest. Right. So we, we think genuinely speaking, if more consumers 10 years from now have debit cards and use buy now pay later for occasional purchases versus everyone having credit cards, we are going to see that's a better world. And losses on our portfolios are about 20, 30 percent below credit card industry standards. So I think that's also kind of some uh, indications of this being a healthier form of credit. But it is still credit, right? Let's just be right. clear about that. Sebastian, you've just posted earnings, third quarter earnings, $201 million operating loss, an improvement quarter on quarter, but year on year, slightly worrying. And yet you still have this goal to push to profitability. How do you reassure your, reassure your investors that you are on that path to profitability? Well, actually, because exactly of that, right? So when, um, you know, last year, obviously, investor sentiment looked very differently than it does this year. And so everyone was asking us to lean entirely into the future and was rewarding us, right? And uh, as much as looking back now, you know, if you think about at, at that point of time, uh, the investment rate we were at, it was consuming about 2% dilution on an annual basis. So it wasn't crazy from that perspective, but obviously investor sentiment has changed. Uh, people want you to focus on profitability. Now, we have the benefit here, Klarna. We were profitable up until 18, 19, when we started investing heavily into the U.S. market. So we know how to make money. Our European uh, business makes about a billion dollars in gross profit annually. Um, so we dis decided, you know, we had to take the, the tough decisions. We actually started uh, being a little bit more conservative on our underwriting already in January and then increased that conservatism in May in, in combination with, you know, um, reducing our in investment into the long term future and they presented a plan. So obviously a year on year comparison right now isn't really relevant because the plan came into effect in May, June. And so far already this quarter versus previous quarter, we reduced our, uh, our, you know, quarterly loss by 42%. So, you know, our investors looking at that feel confident that like, okay, the ambition that we set out when we raised money in May, June to reach profitability again, somewhere month by month basis after summer next year is entirely achievable. And we're on target to, to, to be back at that. The U.S. is an interesting one, isn't it? I think you hit 31 million customers in the U.S. in the third quarter just gone. What did you learn? about this market and then what does the expansion look like going forward for you? Uh, super, super excited by the US. I mean, in despite the fact that we've been a little bit, you know, we've tightened our credit underwriting due to the macro environment. We're also obviously in generally e commerce right now 
everyone is not really comparing apples and apples. It's all apple and bananas because, you know, a year ago I was in San Francisco and there was nobody in the streets. Uh, you know, it was like impossible to get a meeting um, because there was COVID restrictions all over the place, right? So the comparisons are still not entirely there for e-commerce, but we're seeing 90% growth uh, year on year versus last year. And, and seeing tremendous, I mean, I just think more and more consumers in the US are dead tired of credit cards, of, of you know, everyone, just go to Netflix and watch Credit Card Explains and you see all the dirty tactics that the industry has applied against the best interests of its customers. This is a healthy model. You're seeing that shift, right? And your seven, eight percent in your Twitter poll is indicating that, but it's the beginning. It's still the beginning. You got to remember in the Nordics where we're active, Klarna processes more than half of all e-commerce payments, right? So um, it, 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 it tells you something on how effective and, and successful this model can be once it's, but it takes a little bit of time to get there. Sebastian, very quickly, I know you stayed late for us out there in, in Sweden. Layoffs in this industry, layoffs for you? Well, we we obviously unfortunately had to take that tough decision. We did it back in May, it was a little bit earlier uh, than a lot of other companies and um and and but because you know i, I have the benefit of been doing this for 17 years so i was uh, part of Klarna back in the financial crisis of seven and eight and 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 we at least tried to our ambition was to take the tough decision that we unfortunately had to do to the shift in investor yes. sentiment and make those changes so we we hope that we've done what we what we need to do and and consider if the market macroeconomic environment stays the same we think that we've done what we need to do Okay, Klarna CEO Sebastian Shimiakovsky, thank you. Now, ch chip maker TSMC will now offer advanced four nanometer chips when its new $12 billion plant in Arizona opens in 2024. This after U.S. customers like Apple push the company to do so, according to sources. Bloomberg's Debbie Wu reported that Bloomberg scoop. Debbie, what will they be doing then when they open this plant? So, uh, like you said, Ed, the TSMC will uh, announce next Tuesday that they will start making uh, advanced uh, four nanometer chips in uh, Arizona when the plan comes online in 2024. And this is an upgrade from their original plan after uh, customers, including uh, Apple, uh, uh, AMD, and NVIDIA, urged them to make more advanced uh, chips in uh, America. So, uh, uh, this comes at a time that uh, uh, trade tensions and also uh, supply chain disruptions over the past two years have uh, uh, sort of pushed the uh, Biden administration to help bring more uh, chip manufacturing back to uh, America and to make sure that uh, more advanced uh, chips are made on uh, U.S. soil. Debbie, my understanding is TSMC are going to be holding a pretty big party when they unveil this plant and that the president will be going. What are the details? Yes, so uh, President Biden and Secretary of uh, Commerce Gina Raimondo will be attending this so-called toy-in ceremony next Tuesday in uh, Arizona. And this ceremony is to uh, celebrate a, a key uh, construction milestone uh, of uh, TSMC's uh, first advanced plant in the U.S. And in attendance will also be uh, AMD CEO Lisa Su and NVIDIA chief uh, Jensen Huang. And Apple's uh, uh, chief executive uh, Tim Cook uh, is also uh, scheduled to attend the event next Tuesday. For nanometer technology, let's dig into the technology. Why do we care if it's five nanometer or four nanometer? Why is that important for TSMC's customers? Uh, actually, it is also uh, important for the uh, Biden administration because with the uh, 50 billion uh, chips act, the Biden administration is hoping that uh, the latest, uh, the most cutting edge uh, chips will be uh, made in the U.S. eventually. So. Right now, the uh, U.S. is sort of like falling behind Asia one generation or two generations at least when it comes to uh, chip manufacturing technologies. But uh, uh, the Biden administration uh, in the hope to uh, uh, prevent future uh, disruptions and to make sure that uh, America will stay ahead in its competition with China on the uh, technology front. So eventually, uh, I mean, what kind of technologies that uh, chip makers will be able to offer on U.S. soil is of um, uh, utmost importance for the uh, government not, and not just uh, for uh, American companies. This whole story is about expanding manufacturing capacity in the United States, right? Onshoring. Who are some of the biggest yes. names in the world of semiconductors that rely on TSMC? So uh, companies that rely on TSMC in the U.S. include uh, uh, 
Apple, AMD, NVIDIA, and also uh, Qualcomm. And at the same time, uh, Intel, while uh, it makes its own uh, chips, also uh, relies on uh, TSMC on uh, uh, some of its uh, production. So TSMC actually will also uh, announce next uh, Tuesday that uh, it is committed to uh, build a uh, second plant in Arizona to make even more advanced three nanometer chips to help uh, uh, American companies. Okay, Bloomberg's Debbie Wu, great reporting. Thank you very much. Coming up, we'll bring you the latest in the wave of tech layoffs. And as we head to break, let's take a look at shares of AMC Entertainment, jumping the most in six months after investors piled into bullish bets on the stock. Of course, that one of the meme stocks that we've been covering here at Bloomberg Technology for much of last year. This is Bloomberg. Time now for Talking Tech. Layoffs in the tech industry still in the headlines. Sirius XM is the latest to announce job cuts in response to faltering revenue growth. Sales at Sirius grew 3.7% in the third quarter, but analysts now forecast more modest growth, just 1% in the current period. All this comes as consultancy firm Challenger Gray and Christmas says while job cuts were announced across the U.S., the tech sector was hit particularly hard. Of the nearly 77,000 jobs announced to be cut in November, around 53,000 came from tech. No surprise, therefore, the West Coast was hit especially hard. But that's not just in the U.S. This is a global story. Over in Ireland, for instance, tech companies ranging from Twitter, Intel, Stripe or Meta have all been axing jobs. Such layoffs, of course, have raised concerns with the European Commission about tech companies and what they plan to do next, particularly those that are caught up in the narrative around privacy rules. Definitely one to watch going forward. Now, stick with us. Coming up on the show, we're going to speak to the CFO of Visa. Important. Spending, spending, spending. Credit cards. This is not one that you're going to want to miss. Why? holiday season and we want to lens into what's going on. That's Vasant Prabhu, the Visa CFO, coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Now, online spending is up 9% this year compared to 2021. And Cyber Monday's record $11.3 billion in sales per Adobe shows signs the consumer remains resilient in an economic downturn. I've got just the guests for this. Let's discuss with Visa's Chief Financial Officer, Vasant Prabhu. Vasant, thank you for coming on the program. It's good to see you. Your assessment where do things stand? You know, we're, we're entering kind of the back stages of this holiday shopping period. What signs are Visa seeing about consumer activity? Thanks for having me, Ed. Uh, yes, you use the word resilient. And I'd say that's, the, uh, that's probably the best uh, adjective to use to describe the state of the U.S. consumer. You know, we've seen consumer spending stay remarkably stable all year. Uh, you know, we like to compare things to 2019 pre-pandemic to get a clean look. And it's amazing how stable spending has been. We're about 45, 46, 47 percent ahead, uh, almost on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. And in fact, we just released numbers through the 21st of November. And in the first three weeks of November, just leading into the holiday period, we were up uh, roughly that, 47 percent from 2019, uh, up about 9 percent over last year. And then uh, holiday week, 21st to the 27th, was roughly in line uh, on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, also high single digits. We can't yet compare to 2019 because Thanksgiving was uh, later in 2019. So uh, remarkable stability, remarkable resilience, I think that's the best way to 
to describe the U.S. consumer. Right now, we, we're a bit concerned with credit. We're talking a lot, of course, about the, the impact of higher rates on the consumer. And we're also talking a lot about buy now, pay later. Do you have any sense of the split on consumer spend between debit, credit? What risks are the consumer taking right now? Well, uh, you know, it's been roughly the same most of the year. Uh, debit has been very strong uh, relative to 2019. Uh, even in November, debit was up uh, almost 57% over 2019, which is well above the pre-COVID trend line. So debit has been very resilient. And credit has come back in a very nice way. Uh, credit was up 39% or 38% over 2019. Both were up high single digits uh, over last year. So essentially, uh, you know, uh, there's no sense of any consumer stress on the credit side. Um, it, debit has stayed resilient even as credit has come back. Uh, all in all, uh, you know, consumer spending has stayed generally the same. Uh, it's changed a lot below the surface. People are buying different things. People have adjusted to inflation and so on. People are buying more services than goods, more experiences, you know, than products. Uh, and there have been some changes in what people buy as a result of inflation. But the aggregate level of spending, whether it's debit or credit, remains very healthy. Uh, we maybe don't think of Visa as a technology company, but if you think about it, Visa is very much a technology company. My understanding is you have a new boss. Uh, how is that going? What is, what is the 2022 to 2023 version of Visa look like? Well, hopefully more of the same. Uh, we've had a good run. Uh, you know, we, we had a good year uh, in fiscal year 22. Our revenues were up well over 20 percent. Our profits were up well over 20 percent. Uh, you know, Ryan uh, uh, McInerney, our new CEO, has been here a decade. Uh, he and I have worked together for a very long time. Uh, we're all uh, very sad to see Al leave. Al was beloved within the company. Um, but uh, this was all very uh, planned and expected. Um, and uh, our strategy remains the same. Uh, we have great momentum on multiple fronts. We have tremendous growth in our core consumer payments business. We have some significant opportunities in our two new vectors of growth, what we call new flows, that gets us into new use cases, uh, you know, like person-to-person, -person, P2P, like cross-border remittances, uh, like businesses paying consumers, as well as in value-added services. So I think you should expect to see more of the same, uh, and we feel very good about, uh, you know, what's ahead of us. And your new boss? Uh, you should have him on one of these days and, and, and uh, see for yourself. Uh, Ryan is, uh, you know, a great guy. Uh, he, he is, uh, uh, you know, smart, strategic. Uh, he's deeply knowledgeable about the business. He's very well known to our clients around the world. Um, I think, uh, you know, we won't miss a beat. And, of course, Ryan will set the new agenda for the future. I've got to ask you about FTX and the historic relationship between Visa and FTX. You had a debit card partnership. My understanding is you've severed all ties with FTX and any affiliation with Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX. But could you explain to us where that stands to clarify, but also how did FTX get to that stage of relationship with you, given what we know now? Well, uh, you know, we, we do business with a lot of partners. Uh, we do the best we can to make sure we understand, you know, how they're doing business. Uh, like a lot of other people looking at FTX from the outside, we certainly didn't have the knowledge we now have about what was going on. You know, our view is we don't have a position on cryptocurrencies per se, whether they're a good thing or a bad thing or how much Bitcoin should be worth or not. Our job is to facilitate what people want to buy as long as it's legal and as long as it's in compliance with regulation. And all indications were that FTX was in compliance with all regulations. Buying Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies is legal. Uh, we will enable people to do things uh, that are both legal and in compliance with regulations. Clearly, we are as surprised as everybody else has been about what was really going on in FTX. Uh, we no longer have a relationship with them. We really had no financial exposure to them. We were primarily enabling people to buy and sell, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies uh, if they wanted to, you know, buy things on FTX, much like we would do with any other exchange. 
Um, in any case, uh, you know, clearly uh, this has uh, been an eye-opener for everybody. Uh, we will all step up our diligence, uh, and, and, and hopefully there will be uh, further regulatory actions that make this all safer for all involved. Quickly, Vasan, broadly, how has the crypto contagion or, or what we've seen in the markets impacted Visa? Well, our exposure to crypto is rather limited. Um, you know, we are mostly facilitators for people wanting to buy cryptocurrencies, and that's a small part of our business. Uh, you know, we have, um, you know, some amount of uh, card issuance by crypto partners, uh, some of whom may, may not survive, some of whom uh, may, may slow down uh, some of their activities, so it might slow things down in general. But all in all, our exposure directly to the whole crypto, uh, I guess, uh, economy uh, is fairly limited. Now, we are long-term, you know, remain of the view that blockchain is a significant technology. There will be things happening. We will remain engaged with blockchains, with stable coins like USDC and others. We will obviously monitor the situation very closely. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say it has much impact on us uh, at this point in time. Visa CFO Vasant Prabhu, thank you very much thank you. for joining us. We have some breaking news crossing the Bloomberg terminal. The Trump special master review has been halted by a court in the Mar-a-Lago fight. The appeals court vacates the appointment of the Trump special master. The DOJ can resume using seized Mar-a-Lago records in its probe. That according to the court. You'll remember that Donald Trump and Trump's lawyers faced this panel of judges who were reviewing whether there were legal grounds for a special master to review the documents that were seized from the former president's uh, home in Mar-a-Lago. So that is the headline crossing the Bloomberg. Trump special master review halted by court in Mar-a-Lago fight. Meanwhile, shares of Salesforce down Thursday after the company gave an outlook that analysts says reflects a weak economic environment. It also announced the exit of co-CEO Brett Taylor next month, leaving Mark Benioff at the helm. Bloomberg's Brody Force covers Salesforce. Brody, a pretty simple question to start. This is the second time a co-CEO has left Salesforce yeah. in recent history. Why? Well, that's the million dollar question right now, right? I mean, Mark Benioff has been in control of this company for a very long time. There have been multiple moments where it appears that he had found his successor. He has had multiple mentees that were very public, very um, personal, um, and they've gone. I mean, it's difficult to run a company. It's difficult to find a successor, but um, specifically here, it's been an issue, right? I mean, this is the second co-CEO to depart in about three years. Um, so right now, there are a lot of questions about what this means for, you know, a company that is looking for a successor eventually, not this second, but in the in the future. What's interesting, I guess, is now the forward looking question. What does this mean for Salesforce and what does it mean for Benioff? Does Mark Benioff become sole CEO again, for example? Currently, yeah, the plan is that he becomes sole CEO. A lot of folks have asked him, so do you now look for another successor? He didn't quite answer that question directly, but what we do know, this comes at a difficult time for Salesforce. I mean, their growth is at the slowest it's been since IPO. Um, they're under pressure from activist investors to improve profitability, and they're experiencing the same difficult market everybody in the industry is. I mean, Brett was seen as a very even hand, someone that kind of helped the company be more efficient, kind of operate in a good way. And so losing him, it's it's a bad time, most people would say. Brody, as you and I know, we've talked about it a lot, Brett Taylor was also chairman of Twitter before the company <laughs> was bought by Elon Musk and it went private. Did that have anything yeah. to do with it? Yeah, well, one theory a lot of people have been saying is, Man, Brett Taylor had to be burned out, right? I mean, he's been co-CEO of one of the biggest companies in the industry while leading another one of the biggest companies in the industry fighting the richest man in the world. I mean, this is probably one of the craziest years in the books of all time. So the idea that Brett Taylor is ready to go back to his entrepreneurial roots and kind of uh, take things at a different pace, we don't know if that's what happened, but it's not hard to imagine. All right, Bloomberg's Brody Ford, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, how FTX is impacting trust in crypto exchanges broadly, including derivatives platform DIDUX. This is Bloomberg.
This is a setback for crypto, but there's an inevitability that digital assets are going to be part of our future, and we're going to make that bet. We are going to lean into the opportunity set that we see. There are a lot of cheap assets right now. There'll be a lot of distressed assets. Uh, we're going to build for where they think, we think the puck will be in two years. That was Galaxy Digital's Mike Novogratz earlier on Bloomberg TV. As Sam Bankman-Fried's work to create trust in the crypto ecosystem has been hurt for FTX, but also... For its rivals, let's bring in YDX founder and CEO Antonio Giuliano. Your derivatives exchange saw its activity triple in the wake of the FTX implosion, right? I guess the question to start with, is this people shorting crypto? What is the behavior there? So I think the biggest thing is somewhat of a migration from centralized exchanges like an FTX to decentralized exchanges like DYDX, Uniswap, and others. At DYDX, we're proud to be one of the leading decentralized exchanges. Decentralized exchanges have become a pretty significant part of the ecosystem over the past few years. Currently, over a billion dollars a day is traded on DYDX. That's still a relatively small piece of the pie in terms of the crypto markets overall, but DYDX and other decentralized exchanges are something that's really new and I think have been growing a lot in the past couple of years. And I think what's recently happened with FTX just underscores the need for what we're building. I think the volumes have, have been growing immensely in your space, right? But it's still a, frank, a fraction of what's being put through centralized platforms. When does that equation change? I think it's going to take a long time. Um, right now, decentralized exchanges like DYDX, Uniswap, and others are roughly 5% of the entire market. Uh, when it comes to overall crypto trading volume. And I think the thing we have to remember about decentralized exchanges is they're very new. They were just invented about five years ago or so. And only in the past two years or so have they become a significant portion of the crypto volume at all. I think if you're asking the question, when do decentralized exchanges become bigger in terms of trading volume than centralized exchanges on crypto? I think it's certainly a longer term play. I like to tell my team um, and everyone else, I think it'll be about five to 10 years from now. Um, but it's certainly something that we're building towards. And I think it's certainly in the cards for the future. We started this segment talking about Sam Bankman Fried and how he's been speaking publicly. You know, he was trying to build trust in FTX. That trust is damaged. I guess my question is you're seeing more business, right? But why should anyone trust you anymore? than trusting Sam Bankman Freed? I think the beauty of it is you don't have to trust me. Um, you can just trust the code. Really how DYDX and other decentralized exchanges work is they're based on code, not humans or intermediaries. And that's kind of the magic of what we're building. You can look at our open source smart contracts on Etherscan, you can read our audit reports, and you only have to trust those. You don't have to trust me. Um, I don't even have access to any of the funds. So something like what happened on FTX is literally impossible to happen on a well-functioning decentralized exchange like DYDX. One of the reasons that uh, DeFi or more specifically decentralized exchanges are kind of not more mainstream for bigger players is because of the compliance risks, right? There's always a risk of potential money laundering. How do you circumvent that issue? So we run automated compliance checks on the protocol using a lot of data that exists on the blockchain. And we do this in partnership with third party vendors. Um, and I think the thing that's interesting about cryptocurrencies is they're both in some ways more private and in some ways more public than traditional finance. One of the beauties of DYDX and other decentralized exchanges is that everything that's going on is transparent. So you can see the history of funds that every address has used, um, and that's all data that can go into creating a robust compliance solution. And that's one of the things we're also pushing forwards. All right, DYDX founder and CEO Antonio Giuliano, thank you. Now, coming up, Elon Musk's lofty promises with human implant technology goes viral. This is Bloomberg. Now, 
going viral today. A big promises, well, hopes from Elon Musk set out at Wednesday's Neuralink event. Musk says Neuralink's ready to start putting its brain implant into human patients within six months. The brain-computer interface aims at allowing a person with a debilitating condition to communicate via their thoughts. Musk said that Neuralink is also developing implants that can go into the spinal cord to possibly restore movement from paralysis. Bloomberg Sarah McBride covered the event for us. The event exciting, a classic Elon Musk on stage affair. Yep, it was a good one. What were the big takeaways? Well, for me, I thought it was very interesting that while the rest of us are still trying to just wrap our minds around implants in the brain, he's already thinking about upgrades. He spent a lot of time talking about how you wouldn't want just an iPhone 1 if you could have the latest version, right. and they're already thinking about if the first one doesn't work as well, get another one, get a third, get a fourth. I thought that was pretty We, we should point out, I guess, that Elon Musk has a track record of stating timelines and yes. goals and predicted dates that he doesn't meet. And actually, exactly. in the case of Neuralink, that's already true. Yes, it is. In fact, um, when he first started talking about Neuralink, he thought it would be in humans by now. He gave an interview in 2017 and said that by 2021 would be in patients, you know, wide adoption. And so that deadline has obviously slipped. And each year almost, he gives another deadline that slips, which is probably motivating to his staff. There was a demonstration um, of a monkey, essentially, that was uh, the recipient of a Neuralink implant. And right. they sort of demonstrated the use of thought to translate that thought into a digital signal. And uh, it's astounding what they can do. The technology seems to be there. The biggest block to it being real appears to be the FDA. I'd say that's fair um, because other similar, uh, less advanced implants have gone into people in the past to treat things like epilepsy and Parkinson's. The FDA obviously really wants to make sure that these are safe, that they won't degrade over time in the brain. So they have a lot of questions and he seemed realistic about that. He did say the FDA had asked some tough questions. And that talks were progressing yes. well. Yes. Um, is Neuralink on its own in this field? I mean, are other people trying to do something similar? Right, actually there are a lot of companies that are working on different variations of this technology, including many founders from Neuralink who've gone on to start their I think they've companies. left the company and exactly. they- Exactly, there was a big founding team since the company's several years old, many of those people have moved on. They've started different companies. One uh, founder, Max Hodak, has this company, Science, that relies on the optical nerve for implants. There's another one, Precision Neuroscience in New York. And then there are some that don't have um, ties to Neuralink, such as Synchron, which right. uses your blood vessels to get And am I right in thinking, very quickly, Elon Musk said that he would get an implant himself? He said that. He also said he would be happy to put one in one of his children. So. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Well, yes. this is also the man that said he wouldn't get on a SpaceX rocket until he was sure that he wouldn't die on impact on his way to Mars. Bloomberg Sarah McBride, thank you very much. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Don't forget to check out our podcast. You can find it on the terminal as well as online on Apple, Spotify, and also on iHeart. It has been a crazy week so far in the markets, in crypto, for Apple, for Elon Musk and his many, many companies going into the end of the week. We're expecting some pretty big news out of Twitter on progress with verification. Is Twitter blue coming? We're not quite sure. But tune in either way. There's where you can find the podcast. And of course, you can find us on all of our fantastic social media platforms from here in San Francisco to New York to around the world. This is Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.